The season finale is a very important part of the championship. The champion is declared, the final details for the new season are decided and the public gets very hyped by what the show organizers prepare for them. So, what's better than a worldwide iconic city to finish one of the most important leagues out there, the Formula One World Championship? During the years, many cities took this role. The first one was Monza, near Milan, back in 1950. A year later, Barcelona was in charge. And then Los Angeles, with the Riverside Raceway, New York with the Glen, Mexico City, Tokyo and the famous Mount Fuji, Sao Paulo, Abu Dhabi, and many others are on the list. But there are two forgotten races, both run in the same city, who acted as a season finale for Formula One. They are the 1981 and 1982 Grand Prix of Caesars Palace, in the glamour of Las Vegas. As the season opener for 1981 was Long Beach in Los Angeles, the idea for Caesars Palace was to compete for the best venue in the USA. It was a great and ambitious project that unfortunately ran into some not insignificant issues and in the end turned out to create one of the most unusual events the F1 has ever raced on. Racing in Las Vegas saw the light in 1965 with the Stardust International Raceway, a three-mile-long track in Spring Valley. Many legends such as John Surtis and Danny Holm raced here. However, this permanent road course lasted only seven years before being demolished. Although in the same year Las Vegas Motor Speedway opened, no major events in motorsport landed in the city until 1981. The Caesars Palace casino and hotel owners were attracted by the rising glamour of Formula One and the charm of Bernie Eccleston. By hosting a world championship race, the location would receive some reputation and the money would surely come in as the big spenders flocked to enjoy the spectacle. Las Vegas signed a deal to act as the finale of the 1981 series, one week after the Grand Prix of USA East at Watkins Glen. But suddenly, the well-known New York track fell into financial difficulty and failed to pay the quotes owed to the teams from the 1980 race. As a consequence, it was dropped from the schedule, giving the Caesars Palace event even greater prominence. Personnel were booked into the main hotel to enjoy the skyline of Las Vegas from the high ground, and they were granted all of the hotel's facilities. While many did enjoy this luxury treatment, Many others, such as drivers and organizers, didn't, as they faced one of the most bizarre racetracks to ever hold such an important race like an F1 season finale. With organizers pushing for more street tracks, in the 1980s as still today, and citizens complaining about the need to close streets to realize the event, Car parks look like a valuable choice to meet the needs of promoters and inhabitants. Street tracks bring racing the closest possible to people and allow a variety of turns that due to restrictions could not be possible in permanent road courses. The track itself in its location was the biggest problem to deal with. The idea was to build a racing circuit in the parking lot out the back of the hotel and that's not something new or strange. To this day, a few tracks stand in parking lots, like two in France. What made everyone upset about Caesar's Palace was a little and forgettable detail. It was not entertaining, just a sterile succession of 14 turns with no variations in the scenery, no challenge for the drivers, no elevation changes, and lacking everything drivers and fans could enjoy about the track. Due to the limited amount of space to build it, the race circuit was a sort of E-shaped road with some random and poorly appreciated fast corners somewhere in the middle. Grandstands were very rudimentary and uncovered, but spectators could enjoy the show anyway because the track was visible in full from every point. Photographers did not have the same luck. Access to the infield was so limited that only a few spots were good to take some shots. Same as the photographers, the journalists had to walk all the way around the track anytime they needed to reach someone or something. To be honest, it was not as bad as some previous or upcoming racetracks. 
Phoenix, an example, will prove even worse in 1991. Maybe the biggest problem was the lack of reference points. The full course was surrounded by concrete walls and almost no scenery surrounding the track. The three times F1 race winner John Watson remembers, you had this totally flat ground and three foot high concrete barriers so you had very little sense of reference points. It was probably the least appealing Grand Prix circuit I think I raced on. At this point, it was only a matter of racing, as the race day was immediately around the corner. Nevertheless, the sporting prospects looked good. The Formula 1 circus arrived with a title to be decided and three drivers in a shootout for the ultimate prize. Williams driver Carlos Reutemann headed the roster, with Nelson Piquet a point behind for Brabham, and Ligier driver Jacques Lafitte as an underdog. The race was, as expected given the track layout, a little disappointing, even if it had plenty of drama. Jones, despite his antipathy towards the circuit, scored what turned out to be his final Grand Prix win. Behind him many cars broke, the heat got to the drivers and thus the race was boring, but not easy. Reutemann had a particularly anonymous race given his teammates dominance, fading away out of the points and out of the championship hunt, with PK doing just enough to bring home his first title. The effort in the Nevada's desert heat proved almost too much for the Brazilian to bear. He fainted from exhaustion and needed to be carried out from his car at the end of the race. In 1982, another title fight was on, after a tragic season which meant the contenders would not have been the same as those predicted at the outset. Williams had again one driver in the fight, Keke Rosberg, who was drafted in when Jones walked away from the sport. McLaren's John Watson was the other still in the hunt. The Renault Turbos of René Arnoux and Alain Prost were the fastest around the course, though the tortuous layout of the track meant the normally aspirated cars were clearly disadvantaged. The race did at least develop some good battles, albeit nothing exciting compared to the other tracks. Alboreto took his only win for Tyrrell, the last ever for the team. The track record, destined to last forever, belongs to him in 1 minute, 19 seconds and 639. However, what happened the next year probably left everyone surprised and speechless. Formula 1 never really took off in Vegas. The city was in a state of faded glamour from the 1950s heyday and waiting for the developments in the 1990s that would see it become the entertainment center it is today. Poor crowds and lack of interest in the event led to financial difficulties for the Caesars Palace bosses. So they decided to part ways with F1, who then settled in Detroit, Dallas and Phoenix, also being questionable circuits, although not on the level of Caesars Palace. Caesars Palace decided for further attempts to keep the track alive, aiming IndyCar racing instead. In the thoughts of the organizers, IndyCar was something familiar with the American spectators, and thus more interesting, featuring racing stars like the Andretis and Answers. Road courses were a novelty for the predominantly oval series, so some changes would need to be made to comply with the expectations of IndyCar's nation. The infield loops, yet poorly appreciated, were removed, creating what was said to be a modified oval, leaving IndyCar's world confused about what the track intended to be. While it featured fast corners and concrete walls like an oval, it retained the sand traps of the original layout and had two hard braking zones onto and off the start-finish straight. I really think it is a good cause, said John Paul Jr. who qualified on the pole. Anytime you have to downshift and heel and toe the art of road racing, I really do feel this is a road course. The track is very difficult, you can't see around the corners and they're all blind and it's all flat. There's no bank into it whatsoever. It's very challenging, it's a fun place to drive but you have to be very precise. Who's in this agreement is named Mario Andretti. It was that one Mario Andretti and stated it's fantastic, it's one of the best ovals I've ever driven on. 
Mario Andretti in the race kept an unbearable pace, despite a lockup which briefly let Paul Jr. pass by. However, a few laps later Andretti manages to retake the lead and win. For the following year's race, the final turn was widened by moving the outside wall back, which while making no significant difference to the layout, allowed faster laps. Tom Sniva and Mario Andretti were fighting both for the title and for the win. Sniva won the race, but under the checkered flag Mario Andretti in second place won the championship. That however was the final race at Caesars Palace. The site, as per the owner's decision, was soon transformed into a Polynesian themed casino. Moreover, an extension to the main hotel and an upscale shopping center were built. No one walking there would know of the former past of this location, just one of the poorer tracks ever built, that gave us at least three championship battles. Not bad for a hotel car park. <laughs>